so we are going to have our first spotlight session now, um, consisting of uh, three minute spotlights by some of the posters in the evening. We're going to have three of these sessions distributed throughout the day. Um, so we'll have the first one now. Um, Hello, everybody. Um, I would like to present you our work, Answering Visual Relation Queries in Web Abstracted Knowledge Graphs. So a large uh, volume of human knowledge can be represented with a multi-relational knowledge graph, and we usually build knowledge graph with symbolic entities and relations. So um, we extended the typical knowledge graph to the visual domain by representing the entities instead of by just a, si uh, a single uh, symbolic entity, so by a collection of images instead. So we build for that image graph. Um, to build image graph, we started with Freebase 15K, then we crawl images from the web, and the resulting is a database that contains around like uh, 15,000 entities, 1,300 relationships, and in total we have around 800,000 images. So with this uh, type of knowledge graph, there are um, uh, some queries that are um, particularly interesting, interesting to do. So for example, given two unseen images, we can actually ask our system to predict how they are related. So for example, here they are located in. Or given an input image and we can fix the relationship, we can ask our system to query images uh, that satisfies the triple. So something like this. So another interesting problem that can be solved with this type of problems and normally cannot be solved with the symbolic entities is the zero-shot learning. So now we have an image from an unseen entity and we want to know how it is related to our known entities. And this is possible to be done, right? So uh, here there are two types of queries that we also consider. So one is given an unseen image from a known entity and given the unseen image from the unseen entity, we can predict what is the result. Or given again the unseen image from the unseen entity, we want to predict how it is related to one of the nodes that we know from our knowledge graph. So here you can see some of the qualitative results uh, for the um, image retrieval, where the input is a photo of the picture. We fix the start position. And then uh, our system retrieve different images related to, to the baseball. And similarly, here is an example for the zero source learning, where we have a known image uh, from a known entity. And we input, again, an unseen image from an unseen entity on our system. Uh, predicted that um, it is related to the roasting on the coaching, which has a lot of sense. So for more questions, please come to visit our poster. I hope you like it. Medical literature is massive, and uh, there's very limited amount of time that biocurators can actually go in and pull the information out of this literature and generate these databases that we can use to uh, build our algorithms. And as Yejin mentioned earlier, crowdsourcing is a viable option, but there's limitations in funding because obviously you can't pay these people forever. So we're looking into uh, citizen science as a potential solution. Citizen science has been around for a long time. It's uh, the longest running project that I know of right now, has been running for over 100 years, so there's potential for sustainability. Um, the internet has changed the way citizen science can be done. It can be reach now millions of people as um, the most, par uh, most popular and most successful citizen science, virtual citizen science project that I know of. Uh, the Zooniverse has over uh, one and a half million contributors. So we wanted to see if this potentially sustainable and scalable solution could be applied to biomedical information extraction. We built this platform called Mark to Cure, which um, allowed us to test this. And we found that, yes, um, citizen scientists can do named entity recognition very, very well. We wanted to know if they could do relationship extraction. We added an additional module to test that. There were 147 people who volunteered in this test. 
and the distribution of effort was very typical of a, an online citizen science uh, project. We found that we needed about six users to annotate um, one relationship extraction task in order to generate uh, very good accuracy. And this accuracy is actually quite decent considering all of the uh, issues we they encountered um, that we accidentally designed into the system. Um, and it, it hampered their ability to perform. And these issues included uh, common sense uh, issues. When you read something, it's not necessarily, especially with the rules, it's not necessarily what you want them to do is not necessarily how they interpret uh, the rules and what they actually do. And there are also a lot of NER issues. But overall, they were able to perform really well. And we think they can perform even better if we um, implement design improvements. And they were able to generate some very interesting data, data that we found to be quite complementary to um, automated methods. And if you would like to learn more, we are poster number five. Thank you. Good morning. Continuing on this biological theme, um, we would like to announce the availability of a new annotated corpus. It consists of uh, abstracts of biomedical research papers annotated with entities or concepts from the unified medical language system. And our main uh, goal is to encourage uh, models on biomedical concept recognition, and it's available on GitHub. Um, it's the largest uh, biomedical cor annotated corpus so far, and also has a very broad coverage of concepts across biology. But the target concept vocabulary is incredibly large, which is one of the challenges. And um, CZI's main interest is in improving access to medical research, so we're really interested in semantic indexing of papers. So we um, looked at various subsets of UMLS, and so here's one subset of UMLS that we came up with, which we feel might be better suited for semantic indexing. Um, and it's a little bit more than half the annotations in the full corpus. We have released uh, training, validation, and test splits to encourage uh, people doing NLP machine learning concept recognition to publish their results on this data. So the main challenges in uh, doing concept recognition on this type of data is that there's a really large vocabulary of concepts with very limited external semantic resources. And because of this big disparity between the size of the training data and the concept vocabulary, you, you get a lot of concepts in the test data that you don't ever see before in training. So it's a very different kind of challenge from what most people study in named entity recognition and entity linking. To encourage research on this corpus, we have a baseline model that we published, which is based on TAGA1 from NCBI. So as you can see, this model does not do very well when trained on the entire corpus of uh, concepts. Thank you. <laughs> Our next uh, uh, spotlight talk is actually from the best paper award winner. So. Hello, my name's uh, John Guyver. Um, Alexandria uses a probabilistic program uh, to uh, create a generative uh, model going from uh, knowledge to text. 
Uh, and to understand this, let's suppose for a minute we uh, have a knowledge base that contains all the knowledge, all the facts in the world. So here it is. And we're going to assume that uh, facts that are stored in this knowledge base uh, are stored according to a uh, strongly typed schema, which we know. So here's uh, a schema for a person with many, many properties. Uh, and suppose we want to talk about uh, some facts in our knowledge base in text. So uh, let's pick an entity. Here we have uh, George Walker Bush. Uh, and note that the uh, properties are in their native form. So uh, the name is in its component parts, uh, the birth date has day, month, and year, and so on. Now we want to talk about uh, some of the facts associated with this entity. So we need a way of talking about uh, this entity. So let's assume we have uh, a, a, a database of ways of talking about things. We'll call these templates. Uh, and we'll pick a template. So here's a template that links uh, a name property with date of birth and place of birth. Uh, and we'd like to slot in our property values into this template. But we can't do that immediately because these property values uh, are in their native uh, form. So we need to convert these into text using some format. So for example, we might choose to take the first name, the middle initial, the last name. Uh, we may choose to take just the month and the year. Now at this point, we can slot these into our template. Uh, and here we see our filled in template. Uh, and then we can add text at either side of this. Uh, and here now we see a piece of text that looks like something we might see uh, on the web. And we can do this generative process many times. So we can do different templates. Uh, we can do uh, different entities. But this conference is about automated knowledge base construction. Uh, and if we want to be fully automated, we don't have in advance the ways of talking about uh, this entity. We don't have the facts about the entity. And we don't even have a schema. In fact, we start with a completely blank slate. So Alexandria uses probabilistic inference to reverse uh, the arrows. Uh, and from the multitude of text uh, on the web, we can uh, learn about facts. We can learn about ways of talking about facts. And we can also learn schema. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you at our poster. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Michael Wick uh, from Oracle Labs. I'm going to present some joint work with my colleagues there and at MIT on scaling co-reference resolution. So no one in this room would deny that uh, NLP problems tend to be sparse and high dimensional. Usually uh, these representations or these properties are limited to the input only. Sometimes, however, we might want to represent sparse high dimensional objects that are also dynamic. For example, they might change during inference and we want our representations to accommodate this. And this can present computational challenges. And I'll give you an example of a problem for which this is true. In, in particular, it's true for co-reference resolution. And so we're going to look at author co-reference resolution, where given um, a collection of research papers, you want to determine which authors wrote which papers. For example, are these two papers written by the same J. Smith? And we'll have a probabilistic model to help us answer these uh, co-reference queries, which will be backed by a number of different similarity metrics. For example, we'll look at the similarity of the names look at similarity of the titles of the paper, similarity of the co-authors, similarity of the venues. Of course, each of these similarity metrics are themselves backed by these sparse high dimensional representations. For computational reasons, it's then tempting to want to use something like locality sensitive hashing to speed up these, um, this process. Because um, this would allow us to map our sparse high dimensional space into a much lower dimensional space um, that still supports the similarity operations that we care about. And this would allow us to, for example, upfront 
iterate over all our data, all of our mentions, and compute the hash of them so that we can better support these similarity metrics. But this is a problem for co-reference resolution because as we perform co-reference, we're combining these mentions into entities or into clusters. And we want to be able to represent the hashes of these entities so we can compute similarities of them, but we don't want to have to recompute the hashes from scratch every single time because that would be too expensive. So as we merge and we split these clusters or entities, we want to maintain their hashes in an efficient manner. And so for this, we propose to use um, a type of homomorphic LSH uh, for cosine similarity. So we proposed a modification to uh, the SimHash algorithm to support merge and split operations as, uh, we ch as we merge and split the clusters. And this allows us to, instead of computing them from scratch, as I said, use nothing but dense low dimensional vector arithmetic to update the, um, the hash representations. For example, if we want to combine two, if we want to merge two clusters X and Y, we can do so by looking at the hashes for X and the hashes for Y and combine them into um, a, a representation of the joint cluster. And similarly for the other operations. Um, and so it works pretty well in practice. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's a dense low dimensional representation that supports efficient vector updates and we, we get substantial improvements with this, but it does come at a cost of accuracy. And so to figure out, to find out uh, what that cost is and the details of the algorithm, please see our poster. Hello, I'm Bushan from NEC Research Labs Europe. Uh, so we are interested in uh, uh, tackling the problem of uh, predicting numerical attributes on entities. As we know that all real world entities have some sorts of attributes and certain uh, entities have numerical attributes. For example, uh, for locations, there is always latitude and longitude. For people, there is a birth here. There, there are things like height and weight. And essentially, the queries we are interested in is something like, let's say, what is the latitude of Amherst? Uh, the thing, arguably, this sort of queries are more harder than the knowledge-based completion queries, because in the knowledge-based completion queries, we have a set of entities, and we rank a set of entities. Here, essentially, the predicted value could be like, it's in a, re it's in a real number sometimes, right? So it could be anything. So, and other, other challenges that uh, for knowledge-based completion, we have more data, but for uh, entity attributes, we don't have enough uh, data, especially in Freebase or some of this Wikipedia stuff uh, for every entity. Uh, so what are the uh, first steps uh, we could think of? So one is just take the, let's say we want to predict the latitude of Amherst. You just collect a bunch of cities and you just average or maybe take the median or, or the mode or the mean. And uh, that's your answer, right? But uh, perhaps can we do something better than that? Uh, perhaps we could use the knowledge graph. Let's say we mine the knowledge graph from Wikipedia. Uh, the problem is that we could sort of solve it, but we also find in Wikipedia that Amherst apparently has a sister city in Kenya. And let's say if this, this relation is also present in the graph, then it sort of skews the, skews the result. So, so this is probably better using the relational structure. We just look at the neighbors and we average the attributes of those neighbors. But even then, uh, because of the specific relation name or the type of relation we don't consider, we could sort of get uh, skewed results. Uh, so what we essentially try to do is we try to uh, construct a similarity graph in the attribute space. So let's say if you're interested in some latitude attribute, we sort of construct a, a similarity graph, which sort of entities which, uh, which are similar, have similar latitude should be close to each other in, in some sense. And then we use the label propagation uh, s standard semi-supervised learning algorithm to sort of um, propagate this, this labels. Uh, and uh, finally, some of the questions are, so first, so does the model really work? Given the data sets we have, I think we use the standard Freebase and I think from Wikipedia, DBpedia uh, uh, data sets. And the question really is that, uh, does our model really work for all relations? So to find out the answer, please visit our, visit our poster. And another stuff we also capture is that we learn this embeddings, which sort of uh, capture the similarity. We find that we, this, this embeddings, just as they capture the relations as, as aspects, we also, it also captures some kind of a temporal uh, similarity. And finally, we, after we, doing, we did all of this research, we were starting to question whether can we think of uh, entity attributes as generating relations. So to find more about this, please read the poster. Thank you.
Hi. Um, our, I'm going to talk about our paper. Uh, it's about uh, relation extraction from text, so it's very relevant to get new triples for your knowledge base. Um, well, as you know, uh, relation extraction um, understood as uh, identifying relationships in text um, is in general addressed as a classification task. So given textual mentions, in the task is given also a set of predefined types to assign um, a type or none. Um, limitations um, are many, but the main two limitations that we are trying to address here is that when um, many relations are so common that it's easy to find um, hundreds or millions of examples, but um, most of the relations have a very long tail and are very fine-grained, and finding examples in text is um, difficult. And another limitation is that uh, you can only predict uh, or extract relations you have already seen in training data. So what we are um, um, offering in our paper is uh, this new approach for relation extraction that it's instead of as a classification task, it's um, a, a network that uh, outputs representations of textual mentions of relations or entity entity mentions in in text. Then uh, also we uh, created a new um, classification task, uh, one shot that uh, has been released with this paper. And we also provide pre-trained analogy embeddings or entity entity embeddings that can be used in downstream applications. Uh, I don't think you can read this example, but uh, we can talk about this in the poster session. Um, in this, there are two different evaluations here. Um, the one about the one-shot relational classification task um, in the upper line is our model, and the other, the, the second one is um, a previous, all, all the rest are previous uh, baseline based on different textual representations of um, entity mentions. Um, they were in, in this task we uh, train on one only on one data set only and evaluate on the three of them on one shot uh, on a one shot setting that is you are given one example and you need to choose which one is the most likely relation for um, this uh, uh, new pair and in the second example we are showing how uh, using pre-trained embeddings on a new, uh, um, on an existing downstream um, application, can get um, boost a boost in accuracy. And that's it. Hi, my name is Elliot Schumacher. I'm presenting work that I completed with my advisor, Mark Dredzi, uh, from Johns Hopkins University on discriminative candidate generation for clinical concept linking. So m medical concept linking or clinical concept linking is very similar to entity linking in that um, we want to link mentions of entities, or in this case, concepts, to a higher level um, ontology representation. For example, in the sentence, the patient shows signs of um, diabetes in addition to, um, we want to be able to select the correct concept within um, our ontology subset, um, ignoring perhaps other ones that um, aren't as relevant. Um, this is important for identifying um, patient populations for um, studies um, and a variety of other tasks. 
Um, and this task can be thought of as a two-step process. Um, the first one is candidate generation, followed by a re-ranking step. And so in this work, um, we want to focus on a candidate, uh, candidate generation system um, that produces a candidate list that has high coverage, so we are able to identify um, all the, the candidate, the correct candidate, excuse me, um, and a ranking that's a useful starting point. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect, but um, as the ranking improves, it will um, provide a better signal to um, a final re-ranker. Um, and so we use a um, system um, called DISK. Um, that allows for uh, basic lexical features um, to retrieve candidates um, quickly. Um, and this allows us to produce um, a candidate list that's um, robust. Um, and then when applied to an existing system, um, we use DNORM. Um, that is a uh, final uh, linking system. Um, we see that when only considering um, a small percentage of the original candidates, in this case 4%, um, we only have a small um, drop in accuracy, but a larger gain in um, uh, speed. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I want to thank all the Spotlight presenters for, especially for sticking to their uh, time limits. Uh, we have a break right now, almost half an hour. Um, so yeah, we can go out and hang out, and we'll meet back here around 11:15 or so. Thank you. <laughs>